Hey, I'm Lucy Staggerwald for Liberty.me, and today I'm going to have a chat with my friend Calvin. We don't need journalistic ethics and pretending that he's not my friend Calvin, so it's going to be a little casual. And um, I'm going to talk to Calvin mostly about the Free State Project, um, but for a little introduction, he gave me some difficulty with the biography. First it was overly presumptuous, then too modest. Um, I know Calvin because he was um, at Reason at, for some of the same time that I was. So I tried to boss him around and he wouldn't listen. And he took me uh, target shooting one day, and so it was good. Um, these days he's a consultant for Coinbox, which is a Bitcoin-y type thing. Maybe I can ask him a little bit about that if he's interested. He does his own podcast, or co-hosts it rather, called Truth or uh, oh, Truth Over Truth Comfort. Over comfort. Uh, yes, yes, thank you. Um, which we can a ask him to plug at the end of the proceedings. Um, yeah. And he's done some writing in his time, and he makes lots of things, and he's basically uh, the, more of a Renaissance man than most uh, gentlemen I know. So um, let's get started. Calvin, thanks for coming. We finally got it together. My pleasure. Um, okay, so let's get right to the Free State Project. Can you tell me kind of when you first heard about it and when you decided to actually be a part of it? Uh, I heard about it actually when we were at Reason. Uh, just uh, uh, probably Nick Gillespie or somebody wrote an article or something about it. That sounded kind of cool. But I had other plans on the horizon. Uh, I went out west uh, for a while, came back uh, to North Carolina where I'm from, got really bored, and uh, someone mentioned the FSP, and I looked at it and said, ah, what the hell. And the next day I was packing my stuff, and the day after that I left. So it was very. Uh, for the moment. I, I learned a lot about myself during that move, and probably the biggest thing I learned is that I am incredibly impulsive at times. But I mean, I, so far I always, it hasn't. Sorry. <laughs> it hasn't killed me so far, so, uh, you know, it, but then again, it always might. So it wasn't like a consider for years blood oath type of thing. You seem to have taken it in stride in an anarchistic sort of way. You weren't. What, what else was I going to be doing? Honestly, it's, it's kind of what I thought. I'm just like, what the hell? So um, when exactly, how long have you been in New Hampshire then? Uh, let's see, I got here April 7th, I believe. So okay. what is that, about eight months? I can't math very well. <laughs> um, so tell me about what it's like up there. Do you, do you feel like you're among your people? Uh, it's interesting. Uh, there's definitely a very strong sense of community, uh, but uh, I, I feel like uh, many times uh, they're a little too close. Uh, there are a few uh, homesteads and apartment blocks in various places like that that are completely uh, inhabited by free staters. You'll see, you know, 30 or 40 of them living in the same place. And uh, I, I, I think I would probably try and strangle some of them with their own guts if I lived there for more than like a week or so. It, it's uh, yeah, AMCAP drama is probably the worst drama I've ever experienced. <laughs> oh no, really? It is, it is. Uh, you know, the um, as much as I love the idea behind the non-aggression principle, it seems to turn everybody into complete pansies. Uh, mm. There is a lot of passive aggression. Uh, everyone is extremely non-confrontational and uh, gossipy, and frankly, <laughs> I think a lot of these problems could be solved with just a couple of good ass women. You know, they, they could be consensual, just, you know, raise your fist and say, hey, time to throw down, and they raise their fist, and then, you know, the fight's on, and I think that would solve a lot of problems. Now, so, let me clarify that there's many dramatic, passive-aggressive people who are not libertarians or ANCAPs in the world. Just to clarify oh, to you and the audience at large. <laughs> absolutely, but, uh, and, and there, there are plenty of uh, good people in the FSP, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I'm just saying that when they all live together, uh, it, it tends to get a little bit of crazy. I, I uh, actually do not live in Manchester, which is the most concentrated free stater area. I live in Concord, which is about 20 minutes away, and that's a good, healthy distance to uh, live. Uh, no, 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 they're, they're good folks. Uh, honestly, uh, most of my spare time uh, is spent uh, hanging out with these people. I've learned to do all sorts of new things. Uh, I'm looking at being an ordained minister with Free State Church now, actually. I didn't even know there was a Free State Church. That I know oh, there yeah. was a libertarian church back in the day, which I, of course, learned from back issues of Reason Magazine. Now, this one's called the Church of the Sword. Uh, they have uh, several meeting places across the, um, the state. and it, it is an actual church. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's uh, non-denominational, but what they do is they uh, get in fights with foam swords, and then they uh, drink, and then they eat pie. That sounds like a church that you invented. I mean, that sounds like the dream. Every now and then we have Church of the Gun, too, which is also exciting. <laughs> Um, well, can you tell tell me a little bit like um, more about like practically in the real world, I guess, whether you think that free state projects and obviously like seasteading and um, what you call it cities, oh, I'm blanking down in um, Central America. Um, it, well, it, I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, same no. general idea. Like, what? Like, do you think that that has a solid chance of? I don't know, not. Not even winning, you know, winning the day for libertarianism, like, countrywide, but even, like, does it have a, a good in the world, or is it just good for the participants to, to feel like... No, I, I think it actually has had a uh, good impact up here in New Hampshire. No, uh, I, I should start off by saying that I don't think they have any chance in a place that is fairly authoritarian anyway. If the FSP started in Massachusetts, we wouldn't have a snowball's chance in hell, but... Mm -hmm. Fortunately, uh, in spite of the fact that they touch each other, uh, New Hampshire is a very different place. Um, they're I'm trying, trying to think of how to explain this. Um, well, uh, actually, in a practical example, uh, the primaries, the election primaries, were just about a month ago, and I helped out with uh, several of the campaigns there for good money. Actually, I mean, I, I was doing it entirely as mercenary work, but <laughs> they had at one of the uh, free stater clubs uh, just a big um, projector with. Uh, lists of all the candidates that made it through uh, the primary who were free staters, and we got like 30 of them. That sounds better than libertarians usually do. That's for damn it, sure. It's true. Uh, we had a few folks who uh, actually did better than the incumbents in their districts, which uh, no one expected. But, uh, yeah, and, and, you know, even if only half or, or even a third of those people actually make it into office, uh, still... Uh, the fact that we're actually infiltrating the uh, political establishment up here is a step in the right direction that I think people in D.C. never really see through to the end. You know, yeah, on, on a small surprising. scale, it's easier to affect political change. So that, that's one of the reasons New Hampshire was chosen. You know, uh, it's, a, it's a state of, I think, about a million people, but we have somewhere around 400 state reps. That sounds like a success to my mind, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's uh, on our terms. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it doesn't take that much in the way of resources or uh, social capital to actually win an election here. So, uh, yeah, if you start infiltrating places like that, I think you can do a lot of good with it. And then, of course, there are the, there's the communities that are being built here. Um, I don't think I had ever known anybody in my home. In, in Charlotte, North Carolina, is a pretty big city. I don't think I ever met anybody that uh, even knew what a Bitcoin was. <laughs> but up here we have uh, Bitcoin communities. Uh, there are people here who don't really spend cash at all. Yeah. Uh, and then we have other folks that trade in silver. Hell, I got a bag of silver in my pocket right now because uh, there are some merchants I know that uh, are into that sort of thing. That's great. I love it. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the uh, freedoms that I appreciate, uh, particularly the right to bear arms. Um, Indeed. This is one of the, uh, in fact, it might be the only state where you can actually concealed carry a sword without a permit. Fabulous. So I do that all the time. <laughs> yeah. And, um, of course, um, no, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I mean, I can let you go on, but I was going to say, like, what I hear about the Free State Project is mostly, you know, um, putting... Preventing people from getting parking tickets and getting angry about M, uh, Bearcat, uh, you know, uh, army vehicles and stuff, you know, which are all good. But do you? F I mean, are there people out there who are more about the the living free without actively trying to infiltrate? Is everyone like, off? Yeah, like yes, the, yes, the, there the are. divide between like the Wendy McElroy slash Henry David Thoreau, like. Are you going to jail about the Mexican-American War, or are you picking the berries with the boys from the village and the state is nowhere to be seen? It kind of seems like, as with most libertarian things, that free state to me always sounds like it's kind of both at the same time, if that makes sense. What, what I've noticed is that there are really two uh, free state uh, schools of thought. Uh, there's the uh, just living free people who uh, I, I sympathize with a lot more, and then there are the... Uh, fanatics who just feel like getting arrested, uh, who mostly reside in the town of Keene. Uh, Keene is actually a very lovely place. Uh, if you've ever seen uh, Jumanji, that's where that was filmed. So. I never have. <laughs> oh, oh, damn. Uh, watch it. 
But okay. not a small town area, but uh, yeah, it, it seems that all they want to do there is antagonize the police. They have all their dramas. They have a little um, hangout where everyone is constantly being banned. I, I know five mm. or six people who have been banned within the last year. It's, it's just pathetic. And uh, <laughs> they, they essentially make everybody look bad. Uh, but uh, I've, I've had this argument made to me, and I don't know if I uh, entirely buy it or not, but it, it does have a certain amount of credence. One nice thing about the town of Keene and the bikini acts, as they call them, is they, they take all the nut jobs and concentrate them there. If you're crazy and you join the FSP, chances are you end up in Keene, which means that the free staters elsewhere are actually able to go about their business and build a free society without the wackos constantly trying to uh, side rail everything. Does that make sense? It does. I'm just worried I'm going to get you in trouble with, uh, with uh, the free state. I don't know. Maybe that's um, spontaneous, for further examples of spontaneous order and such. <laughs> no, the, the, probably the most uh, antagonistic thing that uh, I've done uh, to um, the, the powers that be up here is they have several protests uh, every uh, couple of weeks where, uh, the, the, in Manchester, the, the main city where I hang out a lot, their um, police department uh, essentially announces when they're going to have late night checkpoints. So we go out there with signs and stand in uh, roads where you could still strategically turn away and basically have you know signs waving, turn back now, there's cops ahead and stuff like that. And I know people, people have gotten trouble way. for holding signs to warn of um, speed traps. I'm not sure if you could, I assume you could potentially get in trouble for warning about um, a checkpoint. I don't know though, I've never... It hasn't happened so far and we've been doing it for a while, at least as long as I've been here. Okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> and then people seem fairly appreciative of that. In fact, there have been a couple of times when I haven't been able to make it where I've been driving down a street and I see the uh, signs like, oh, right. That's <laughs> Man, that's good. The system works, as it were. <laughs> um, hmm. What else about the Free State Project? Um, do, you think, do you think you'll stick around there for a while? I don't know, uh, and it's not because I don't like it, it's just because, uh, you know, th this is the longest I've been in a place since college. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I seem to be a leaf on the wind. Uh, hopefully I won't be impaled by a spear. That's, you know, I was going to say, we don't yeah. want you to end up like Wash. No. Um, not, not, not so much with that. You've got to watch out for those reavers. Um, but the, the nice thing about this community here, and we, we've had people move away for mm -hmm. various reasons, uh, but you're always welcome back here. We... we uh, give people a hearty welcome when they return. Uh, I know for a fact that if I was ever to leave this place, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be gone forever. Do you think? I guess this is basing on even you know uh, liberal friends, uh, you know, somehow getting offended by my the libertarian ranting that is my Facebook page, um, <laughs> and even like sometimes in DC libertization that you live in a bubble. But, you know, in D.C., it's Mordor. It's the bubble of comfort so that you don't stand in the middle of the street yelling at the Capitol building until they drag you away in leg irons. Which is to say, is it healthy to be even in as much of a bubble as the Free State Project or, you know, any other libertarian group it is? And is it even possible to be in a bubble when the world is so unlibertarian? I don't think it is. Uh, the FSP isn't that large yet. I, I was, uh, let's see, mover number uh, 1599, I believe. And that was just a few months ago. So we have maybe 16, 1,700 people up here now. Uh, that's not big enough to really completely insulate yourself. Uh, now, that said, it would be a lot harder in a larger state. You know, uh, in a state of a million people, uh, 1,500 is a little bit more. But no, uh, we, we, we regularly uh, interact with the outside world. Uh, I, up until I got this recent job with Coinbox, was uh, an entirely working in the outside world. Uh, there, there aren't that many uh, libertarian businesses up here for a while. So everyone has their jobs. Uh, honestly, I, I have found that, uh, with a few notable exceptions, I've had to choose between people who don't judge me for my lifestyle choices and people with no severe mental or social problems. So uh, I'm sure you you understand. Uh, I don't know. They're libertarians of of all of our nightmares, but mostly in life, I I find them all such a great comfort. Maybe no, because they are. They are. But what I, what I'm saying is, when it does get to be a little bit too much. It's not like this community is inescapable. Mm -hmm. Sure. You just go down the street. It's an 
it's in a, a part of the country just like anywhere else. Uh, you're going to meet people of all stripes and colors. Uh, I have all kinds of stimulating conversations with other people about all sorts of things, not just politics. I haven't let it consume me, although I can see how you would if you were really hell-bent on doing so. Yeah, I mean, I've always been... I find it suspect when I've gotten these bubble accusations because it invariably comes from some of the most liberal people I know who, I mean, not to sound like Fox News myself, but who you know who watch MSNBC and I am might be their best friend who <laughs> isn't actually a liberal. I mean, I think there there is an odd slur against like libertarians as a cult coming from people who, if they haven't won, they've you know they've they've fifty one percent won over us. So I should probably not give them any credence at all. But I was just curious. What you thought about that? And what was the question? Uh, that, that oh, that was just that was that was that was exposition. <laughs> okay. <laughs> exposition or um, narration about the the state of things. My problem is I always I always kind of wish the Free State Project had picked um, Wyoming. Actually, yeah, it's, it's close to my beloved Montana. Uh, I'll tell you what, though, having lived out in Wyoming for a few months, uh, the parts of it that aren't completely hideous take a six-figure salary to live in. Mm. Which is rather problematical. Yeah. I, mean, I think you could pick... I don't, I don't know. Wyoming does have its merits. It, it is equally free here. There's the no income tax, which is nice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, in fact, uh, we have no sales tax here in addition to that. I don't remember Wyoming having that, although it's been a while. Things could have changed. I'm not sure if there's any other state that has no sales ta tax. It's not many. Um, I seem to remember that being kind of exceptional on New Hampshire's part. I'll tell you what, it took a while to get used to it because whenever you're buying stuff, uh, just, you know, the gas station or whatever, I, I'm used to calculating, okay, this is about how much it's really going to cost. Mm-hmm, sure. And then I, I just don't have to do it up here. It, it's, it's, it's crazy. The dream, the dream. Um, I, I don't think people realize that it doesn't have to be that way. That's, that's what gets me, dude. Like, I, the world... Nature is unfair, and disease, and Ebola outbreaks, and hurricanes are all unfair. But the unfairness of bureaucracy and just the state always gets me because, it, inarguably, it doesn't have to be that way. You know, like I don't need to pay my taxes on April fifteenth. I, I am I am made to do so, and that it's not it's not a, it's not a fact of nature, and that always bothers me more. Well, you're preaching to the guy who privatized the choir. I'm right there with you. <laughs> Indeed. Um, I want to ask you also about anarchism without adjectives, which is a thing that I heard about from other people, but I first heard about from you. Um, okay. what about? Explain it to the people. What does that well, mean to you? Uh, essentially, um, I'm not an economist. I, I have no pretensions of uh, economic expertise. And I don't think that uh, economic preference is the main end game. Mm -hmm. I don't care if we live in a capitalist society, a mutualist, or even a free communist one. What's important to me is the absence of state. Uh, you know, the, 500 years ago, capitalism was not a thing. Uh, the closest we had was mercantilism. And it, it was the best for creating a free society at the time, but that sort of thing does change after a while. And uh, I see too many uh, ANCAPs, and there are plenty of anarcho-communists that are the same way, who are more obsessed with their particular preference for an economic scheme than they are with the end goal of ending the state. Uh, so the, the way I see it is, um, you know, I, I do have my own personal economic preferences, but if it's demonstrated to me sufficiently that another uh, economic policy would lead to a freer society, I will change my mind in a heartbeat. And I think everybody who's really serious about ending the state should be the same way. Well, I mean, I think that last thing you said is to me, to my mind, is more backwards because okay. the lack, the lack of a state, um, to me, would the lack of the state is the end game and is is the goal. Um, but I don't think that there would necessarily be an economic policy in that world. There would be competing economic policies well, exactly. and interactions. That, that's the thing. Yeah, and I, yeah, I, I know plenty of people who would argue that no, there can only be capitalism in statelessness, or there can only be communism that everything else is some sort of uh, kind of pseudo-state, uh, just because it's not uh, an economic preference of their own. Right. The, the lack of coercion 
I, how you would get to that the, the e economic world that is a lack of economic coercion, let's say. I don't know how you would get there beyond a lack of coercion. I mean, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think you, you know if you suddenly decided you could prove that um, uh, you know communism, uh, stateless communism, could somehow lead to this this uh, lack of coercion world. It wouldn't. It it it, it conflicts. Upon itself, it doesn't. The lack of coercion being the thing makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and yet, I feel like there might be people who would argue with you on this point because oh, I are, know people. I know libertarians who say that the it is the the, the free market that can sort of non ideologically spread freedom. And I think what, that what does capitalism have to do with the free market? Would be my next question. They might grant you that, certainly, um, depending on uh, what words they use. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Is I can think of at least three definitions for capitalism just off the top of my head. There's the uh, collaboration of uh, state and uh, business and cronyism, essentially, like we have today. Mm -hmm. There's the uh, exploitation of uh, those without money by those with capital, as we saw in the Industrial Revolution. And there's the uh, free market uh, model that most libertarians can play with capitalism. But... Uh, Unfortunately, I, I feel like the uh, the word itself has way too much baggage. Does that make any sense? That's like the Sheldon Richman, etc. type type. Yeah, there are plenty of people who uh, will will completely go along with your uh, arguments for free markets, but the second you use the word capitalism and say that you are actually compassionate about the poor, they just won't believe you. <laughs> it's true, but then there are people who think that you you know you must be a big coercive commie if you have some problem with the word capitalism, if you're trying to um, evade from the term. And I think both people are wrong in that, in that, in that way. Agreed. Um, and some of the left, so-called left libertarians that I've met will, will grant that state capitalism, say what we have now and what we've had, is closer to free than state socialism, or, or, or certainly. Um, I'll tell you what, though, uh, about state communism is from everything we've seen so far, it's not particularly stable. So if you really have uh, sort of the long game in mind, you might argue that uh, it's more beneficial for states to uh, adopt state communism because uh, it's more uh, likely to crumble. I, I always feel a little, I feel it's a little risky to make that kind of argument because it's, it's too close to let's draft people to end um, <laughs> imperialism. You know, there, there's the danger that the short-term ruin, that you're endorsing something horrible in the short term that is, you know, not acceptable. But, I mean, yeah, that's an interesting uh, concept. It, it, it's a perspective that deserves a closer look, shall we say. It doesn't mean I'm entirely convinced by it. Now, if I was to draw a Venn diagram between sort of the anarchists that you know frolic in the East Bay in California and and the, and the your average ANCAP, I might put you in the middle, um, just from the way that you describe what you believe, because in some ways, to call yourself just an anarchist suggests that you should be wearing a black hoodie in a black block. Um, I mean, you don't we, like Duster. That's fairly close, but it's more in accord with my own stylistic preferences. Right. I mean, the thing is, the 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 left anarchists, social anarchists, whatever you call, I call it the black hoodie anarchists more. I mean, hmm. In my experience, they don't prioritize lack of coercion as like purely as as you do. And to me, that's maybe why you, you, you belong or you can fit in with the Free State Project people more than you would in, you know, the East Bay of California, if that makes sense. Like, you, you're, a, you're like a new breed from the libertarians that I, I knew for a long time, um, and I'm meeting more and more of them. A lot of them call themselves left libertarians, mm. but why aren't you, what, what, what about you doesn't belong with the other type of anarchist who might me. call you a big um, capitalist? pig, probably, just because you're close close enough. Uh, essentially, it's that I don't believe in preemptive violence. Uh, I'm all about self-defense. I believe if you're attacked, uh, hit back a lot harder and more frequently. But mm. uh, I don't believe uh, that I have the uh, moral uh, certainty to make the first move. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, what if... I, I, I also don't think that... Uh, 
every time you see a revolution that uh, was particularly violent in its origins, uh, it, it hasn't really succeeded in the long term. Yeah. Not, not that we've seen that many peaceful revolutions. Uh, not, not so much, no. And I oh, actually, uh, obviously, I would argue the restoration of the monarchy in um, uh, England. Uh, what was it? Right after the English Civil War, after Cromwell died. That was a peaceful revolution just because uh, the state had been so god-awful for so long that people welcomed back a uh, more sane alternative with open arms. That, that's really what we need to do at this point. Uh, we need to uh, bring back the monarchy. Ourselves if, that, if it ever comes to that. But uh, peace is the way forward. Uh, the, the, the way I see it is this. Is, uh, if we're ever in a position to successfully launch a violent revolution, it will no longer be necessary. Does that make sense? That's something to dwell on. I was taking a moment to get, <laughs> taking a moment with that one. Um, hmm. um, that got me a little bit off of, of my, my, my my line of questioning, which I'm fading on due to a lack of, of, of caffeine and blood sugar. So but why like I met you with reason though, right? Like right. In the belly of the beast in D.C. and in a relative, I mean, a, albeit a nonprofit type of, but it's a, it's a you know very capitalist, very free markety. Um, what were you doing there? I mean, what? <laughs> Honestly, uh, ANCAPs have better scholarships. If you had met me a year before then you would have been very surprised to see me there. I started out, uh, my, my, my road to anarchy has been uh, probably um, a little more random than most people's. Uh, you know, <laughs> everyone I meet up here got to uh, anarcho-capitalism through Ron Paul. I was actually a big fan of uh, Bakunin. Uh, and in fact, I still do love his writing on religion and uh, science. But he was the uh, essentially the first anarcho-syndicalist. Uh, mm -hmm rabidly uh, devoted to uh, militant revolution. And uh, I'll tell you what, uh, this is kind of off topic, but if uh, modern ANCAPs could write half as well as he did, we would have already, you know, established like a, a libertate by now. But, but that's that point. Uh, no, um, honestly, I, I, I have never... Maybe it is just that I don't really care about economics. <laughs> I, I've seen them as uh, being... Uh, a lot more linked than most people do, just because uh, the the reason for their separation is not something I particularly care about. What is the reason for the for the separation? Oh, I mean, uh, capitalism versus communism. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's not it something that matters to me. So therefore, the differences between them don't really uh, influence me at all. I mean, I just, I definitely read a Wendy McElroy thing about how if, you know, your neighbors down the street want to start a commune, she's she's not going to come, you know, knock on the door and demand that they embrace free markets. So, in, in some ways, your stance isn't, it's not as of the left as some people might think. It's just that, I don't know, I... I I'm just being bogged down by sort of, sort of inter-libertarian wars between left libertarians and like vulgar libertarians, and there's there's no war there at all, but like libertarians. There, there shouldn't be. We we just need to all learn to get along and hate the state. And once once we figure that out, we'll we'll start making leeway a little bit more than we have. And the difference between you and the left libertarians and and the liber um, the anarchists that I met in college and in the East Bay. Or that you all of all of you prioritize the state as the biggest problem and the biggest obstacle to overcome, and a lot of the anarchists and they give me plenty of scare quotes, so I'll give them right back. Um, mm. That I have met, they say, "Oh, sure, of course I want anarchy, but you know, state benevolent state socialism is my is my second choice, you know, and let's do that until we get anarchy." Which to me, just, no. <laughs> That's just straight up Marxism. Isn't it? I thought it and, was, and yet there have been anarchists <laughs> calling that out since the very beginning. Bakunin, the, the guy that I used to love so much. Yeah, uh, in fact, I think he got kicked out of the International for basically telling Marx, you know, this is going to become a really terrible dictatorship. <laughs> that was a good point. 
Uh, Marxism. I don't even understand how it's supposed to work. Most of it, the the progression and the inevitability of history and all that crap. I don't. I don't. I don't the, get it. the problem with really smart people sometimes is they're more capable of convincing themselves of bullshit. Hmm. That's another one to dwell on, to mull over. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't. But I don't. I don't hate capitalism enough to be a proper anarchist, even according to um, my, my my beloved cousin, the uh, black hoodie wearing so and so. I don't know. I mean, I don't hate capitalism either. I, I'm just fairly indifferent to it. It it, <laughs> it it really comes down to coercion for me, not mm -hmm. not how I exchange goods and services. I think uh, I'll, I'll tell you what. Uh, something I have. Uh, realized up here uh, in the FSP is that uh, as, as much as everybody uh, talks about capitalism, uh, social capital really is the most important resource to have up here. Mm -hmm. uh, mo most of the time people really do help themselves out. It, it is a lot more communitarian uh, than a lot of folks might realize before they show up here. Um, I've participated in 15 or 20 moving parties. You just help people unpack their stuff when they move up here. Uh, folks. Um, I mentioned one time, just casually, uh, someone asked me how my day was going, and I said, a paycheck's late, and I'm going to have trouble getting by. And before I knew it, a guy handed me a couple hundred dollars cash and just said, get it back to me when you can. Uh, yeah. You hear that, leftists? You hear that, salon.com? God damn it. <sighs> Sorry. But no, uh, until you move up here, you, you wouldn't see it in any of our media. But uh, yeah, the, the friendliness and the, um, the sense of community really surprised me. I mean, I'm not surprised if only because a lot of people, you know, certainly statists and all, and every statists and anarcho-capitalists and everyone in between are nice to people a lot of their, like, people are fundamentally not that bad much of the times, especially when they're in an environment when they're relatively secure and they have, I mean, it's just, it's not that surprising. It's not. <laughs> People aren't really that bad, turns out. <sighs> Sorry, I just had to no, rant no, angrily sure. about optimism for a minute there. Except objectivists. Objectivists uh, would consider any of that <laughs> stuff a mortal sin. <laughs> oh, my confusion about objectivists is almost... Oh, I can't yeah, that does really bother me how much uh, Ayn Rand is used as kind of the poster child, and then she wants a child, uh, the poster child of... Uh, right libertarianism, and uh, okay, it gonna... doesn't represent that much of the community here. I know, like, maybe three of them. Mm -hmm. I think a sprinkling of objectivism um, on some people, uh, uh, an objectivist influence has worked out to make some people I really like who are very smart on things, but pure objectivism, I, I'm i not going to say that, it, you know, you can't be okay, but I think of Leonard Peikoff making Bill O'Reilly seem like a dove on foreign policy, and I, I don't get objectivism. I think that I should probably read more about it so I can try to understand it better, but to me, it really it feels like a parody of libertarianism. I would love to like it just to spite salon writers, but it feels like a parody of libertarianism, it, like, like, like a straw man version, and I'm very confused by it. That's not to say Rand wasn't smart. Um, if you watch her talk in interviews, she's obviously smart, but I don't I don't really get her right now. Most of her philosophy was really just straight up cut and paste from other sources too. Uh, you, you realize how much she just directly uh, took uh, Aristotle, for example. Mm -hmm. and uh, she yeah, pretended I, libertarians ripped her off. I mean, as if the 19th century didn't exist. <laughs> you know, as if that those ideas hadn't been there long before she was alive. Um, I think that's the thing. It's how much she claimed was original. Uh, which is fine. I mean, we, we all borrow from each other, especially in philosophy. But to just completely rip from just a couple of sources and say, no, this is all me, <laughs> uh, it, it's a little pretentious. And by mm. a little, I mean like, like this many. Thanks. Yeah, I'm not going to say never, but so objectivists, don't, don't gather your torches, but I just don't know. Oh, I'm a co-host with one. <laughs> Are you? Oh, oh yeah, well, yeah. There's our segue right there, because I think we've got to wrap this up so we can all do our other things in life. Um, right. Well, do you want to tell tell the good people about your podcast and plug anything you like in this world, and then? Okay. Go well, uh, it's called uh, the True Objective. Uh, we've been going. I believe this is our fifth episode. Uh, there was a previous co-host last season, but uh, he had to step down for. 
uh, a number of reasons. Uh, the title did make more sense then because it was two objectivists, and uh, I am a lot of things, but as we have uh, discovered, an objectivist I am not. <laughs> but uh, so far we've been talking about the history of money. Uh, got into Bitcoin yesterday, and uh, coming up we're going to be talking about the worst 44 presidents in American history. All of them. Spoiler. All of them. I think we should give honorary mentions to uh, Jefferson Davis and Brigham Young, too, because I believe they were presidents in what is now the United States. I think that's probably true. Sam Houston too. You know, just, just cover everyone. That's a lot of ground to cover. A lot of bad people to talk about. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, I do write on uh, Liberty.me on rare occasion, uh, and I need to do that a little bit more often. And mostly, I just spend the rest of my time being all around Liberty dude and good guy, and having a lot of fun in the FSP. Well, that is an excellent note to end on. Um, you send me the link, and we can plug your podcast some more. Um, and we should talk more, because you are pretty awesome. Um, sure. So, Calvin, thanks for joining me and for uh, ragging on libertarians and objectivists and everyone else that we like here at Liberty.me. And um, I will see you, future audience, next time. <laughs>